Is the impulse drive in Star Trek a faster than light drive? In today's video, uh, we'll explore that question. This video is fair use and is protected by federal law 17 USC 107, section 107. So, we're going to visit four episodes today, Balance of Terror, Where No Man Has Gone Before, Doomsday Machine, and The Naked Time to try to answer this. And we're talking Alpha Cannon material only. I unfortunately don't have the time to look into the tech manuals. I know they say that it's not a faster than light drive, but the tech manuals are not canon. Michael Okuda says it's not faster than light, but my, what Michael Okuda says is not canon, so we're looking at alpha canon only. In Balance of Terror, we see the Romulan flagship, and make no mistake, it is the Romulan flagship, attacking Earth outposts on the Federation side of the neutral zone. And this is where the controversy begins, because in the briefing, Mr. Scott says that the Romulans have simple impulse power only, and Kirk says, meaning we can outrun them. And that's where the question begins. Now, I don't think that a seasoned uh, professional like Mr. Scott would make a mistake as to what is powering another starship. It would also mean that Mr. Spock has made a mistake when scanning the ship that he missed something, and I don't think that that's possible either. I think that Mr. Scott is accurate in his assessment that the Romulans are using impulse power only, and that's their highest form of energy output. And I'm sorry, Mr. Sulu, I will be taking over at the helm. So, because some people assume that impulse is a slower than light drive, they think that the ship was either towed into place or some kind of warp sled was used to move it into place, and they do so without any evidence from the episode at all. It's pure speculation on their part. And like I say, I don't think that that's how this ship is moving around. It should have some form of faster than light drive. Also, you'll notice that this ship has what appear to be nacelles on the left and right side, just like the Enterprise. And that just seems to confirm that this has some form of faster-than-light travel. Now, I can see where the Romulans could have pushed the efficiency of the impulse drive further than the Federation. After all, the Federation had impulse drive and then they discovered the matter-antimatter equation where they can now go to warp speeds and the Romulans having not discovered it still had a hundred years to perfect the impulse drive so they possibly have greater efficiencies in the impulse drive to where they can do some form of space warp um, without a matter-antimatter reaction. And so that's part of my speculation in this video. So now I'd like to also move on to this chart because some people have said that this is not uh, the Romulan Star Empire, 
may not be an interstellar empire? Well, this chart seems to disagree with that in my professional opinion. And in order to establish my uh, credentials, I will say that I served in the U.S. Navy and I navigated ship while I was in the Navy. And you can see me here on the left with a marine grade sextant in my hand. I was taking a solar shot uh, that day to establish our local line of longitude. And here I am on the right and I did say Mr. Sulu that I was going to take over at the helm. And this is me as Master Helmsman on the helm. So sorry buddy, you're out of a job for a day. And by the way, where did my hair go? I really want that hair back. So, I also happen to be a professional engineer now. This drawing over my shoulder is an award-winning drawing that I did back in my days when I was doing drafting before I actually um, started my engineering. I was a draftsman and I worked my way up to engineer. And so this is what a graphic, a graphical distance scale should look like um, on a chart. Uh, on the top we have an equivalent unit and a unit measure. So the unit is one inch, the equivalent is 20 feet. So in the graphic scale on the top, one inch is equal to 20 feet. That's very clear. Then on the bottom we have a metric scale and it says the unit is one and the equivalent is 100 so one unit is equal to 100 units in the real world on that metric scale on the bottom so now let's get back to this chart the reason i say that this is a stellar empire an interstellar empire is because of the colored dots the colored dots are red, white, yellow. Um, there may be a blue one in there every, every once in a while. It looks like there are. They're kind of hard to see. And what people think of as a graphic scale is probably not the graphic scale that they think it is. You see it under the text sector Z6, and I've clipped it and enlarged it here at the bottom right and I think that this is a temperature scale and the reason I think it's a temperature scale is because to the left of it are these is this circle that is half white and half yellow and it just so happens that a white yellow sun is around 5000 degrees Kelvin so I believe that that is what those colored dots represent. And you can see here you've got yellow and white and red stars on both sides. So I believe that the Romulan Star Empire is actually an interstellar empire because the neutral zone covers all those stars on <clears throat> the right-hand side. And probably a lot more because this is just one sector. And nice bit of continuity here. The Romulan sun is red. It's a red giant. We also know that uh, Vulcan's sun is a red giant. So that's a nice little bit of continuity. So, as I say, I think that this ship, flagship of the Romulan star empire, an interstellar empire, has a form of faster than light drive where they're using impulse engines to drive that ship faster than light. I don't think that there was something missed in the scans. I don't think there's a I don't think that there was a singularity that was missed in the scans. Mr. Spock wouldn't do that. I think that he he's too much of a professional. And I don't think that there's a warp drive that's got that got missed either in the scanning of the ship. Uh, so Scotty would not have made that mistake either. Having listened to Spock's report, 
I don't think Scotty would have made that mistake either because he, too, is a seasoned professional. So, we've established now that the Romulan Star Empire is actually an interstellar empire based on that chart, and it's still speculation on my part whether or not the Romulans have the ability to go faster than light using simple impulse. So now we go on to the next episode, Where No Man Has Gone Before. And it's established in this episode that the ship travels three light days in a certain period. Uh, this is the episode where two of the crew get shocked when they enter the energy barrier at the edge of the galaxy and these two survive several others die um, and the two of them start to develop superpowers what's also established in the captain's log and this is where you have to listen very carefully because it's established that they have no warp capability after they've encountered the energy barrier and they're proceeding back on impulse power only. So, their ability to warp space is compromised. They can't use it until they get to Delta Vega. And the start date is 1312.9 when the captain explains this in his log that they have no warp drive capability. They only have impulse power. Later on, Spock clearly states that Delta Vega, which has a, an automated lithium cracking station, is three light days away. So they set a course for Delta Vega where they think they can scrounge parts to fix their warp drive and also, because Gary Mitchell is becoming so powerful, they need to strand him on the planet. Of course, Spock thinks that they have to kill him, and it turns out Spock is ultimately correct. Now, they reach Delta Vega on start date 1313 1313.1, I believe, is if I remember correctly. I know it's 1313 13 point something. So... They've essentially traveled three light days in less than one star date. And by the way, just an, just an aside, I love this matte painting. It's such a beautiful painting right here. And it's kind of a lost art. I really wish there were more practical effects in... Um, in modern Trek, uh, just sometimes the artistry is lost. So that's just my personal opinion. So next we have to go and visit the Doomsday Machine where an ice cream cone of death actually tracks down two starships that it doesn't have to and it starts attacking them needlessly because they can't really damage it, at least from the outside. And Matt Decker finally figures out how to damage the damn thing. Um, but if it had just continued on its way without attacking them, uh, you know, it probably wouldn't have uh, it probably wouldn't have made a difference. Uh, so the anyway, the ice cream ice cream cone of death starts attacking them, and this thing looks devastating as all hell. I mean, look at it; it looks like a solar prominence. Uh, you know. That's pretty damn scary, if you ask me. I, I'd be pretty scared if, if this thing were chasing me down. So, it's also established in Doomsday Machine that the constellation, which has no crew left, and has no warp capability left, but has the impulse drive left, the... Two systems can be interconnected, so there's compatibility between the two systems. And i got to say, this is kind of a brilliant idea. When you can 
connect the controls from one type of drive to another type of drive and that's a beautiful piece of engineering i gotta I, I, you know that's just brilliant so i gotta say that is just uh, that just impresses the hell out of me so scotty is here he's about ready to cross connect the two systems so they can use the warp controls to power the impulse engines now this is also not a direct connection but it does show that there is compatibility between the two so there is something there that is um, possible to use for um, warp drive and impulse drive so finally we end on the naked time and in the naked time we we get to see that somebody other than Kirk gets to run around topless on the ship and I gotta I can't fault Joe Tormolin for breaking quarantine here you know this is the episode where everybody gets the disease where their inhibitions are lowered so they start acting out their fantasies and I can't really fault Joe Tormolin um, because he does die in the episode and he is dead at the end of the episode because even though they travel back in time he is still dead at the end of the episode so I'm not going to fault him for that because he he paid his you know he paid in spades um, for his mistake but they do travel back in time because they have to restart the engines cold and there's a formula that Spock remembers that is um, equates antimatter and time somehow and so they get the engines restarted and they travel back in time and this is where they clearly establish what a star date is now they don't say how the star dates are derived but you can clearly see that a star date is actually about a 24 hour period in this episode because here we see the ship's chronometer and a chronometer is a fancy term for a clock but it's actually a more accurate clock than a, just a regular clock at least in the time of the US Navy today um, it's a more accurate timepiece than just like the wristwatch you might wear on your on your wrist or a clock that you have hanging up in your office or something so it is an accurate timepiece and we can see here that the ship is going backwards in time. I like the fact that these lights are red. That, that actually means that the engineers thought about the fact that the ship could potentially somehow travel back in time. And they made an indicator that shows that you're traveling backwards in time. Because when you're moving forwards in time, the lights are green. So anyway, the star date here is 1705.0 when they start traveling backwards in time and it's about 14 minutes after midnight according to the shipboard clock. Well, Sulu re recognizes that they're traveling back in time and reports it and then Kirk orders them to stop. And when they stop, the star date is now 1702.0 and it's <coughs> excuse me I, I am a little I'm getting over a cold um, the star date is 1702 and the shipboard time is 0108 minutes 02 seconds which means it's like 1 a.m. in the morning and Spock clearly states that they traveled 71 hours backwards in time. Now going to the previous image here, it was 1705, 14 minutes, 15 seconds, 
past midnight, and then as they stop, it's 17.02, 0100 hours, 0802 seconds. So, Spock is a little off on his precision here, but I gotta say, that clearly establishes that one star date is 24 hours, approximately. And going back to what I said earlier with where no man has gone before, we see that the ship can travel three light days in under one star date. So under one 24-hour period, the ship has traveled three light days. And it's traveled that using impulse power only. So, I know the star dates are a mess in general, but they've clearly established, meaning to or not, they've clearly established that a star date is a 24-hour period or so. Also, and this is thanks to Salty Trekker, um, in the motion picture, one half impulse is established in the motion picture to be one half the speed of light. So, if your speed of light is 1c and half the speed of light is half impulse, which it's established in the motion picture as being accurate, then they can at least use impulse, the Federation can at least use impulse to travel at 1c. Now, why do I say this? Well, because if you're traveling at half the speed of light, it would take you about 1.8 hours to travel to Jupiter at half the speed of light. In the motion picture, they are traveling at one half impulse, and it takes them 1.8 hours to get to Jupiter, which we see here. And that's all thanks to Salty Trekker pointed this out in one of his uh, broadcasts. So I have to thank him very much for that. And as I say, if they have pushed the engine efficiency higher, uh, there is the possibility that the Romulans, especially because they didn't determine, they, they couldn't figure out how to warp space, or they didn't have the antimatter matter reaction that the Federation has, they couldn't warp space as efficiently, they would have taken that hundred years to improve upon the impulse drive that they do have, and they could have gotten greater efficiencies out of the impulse drive that the Federation doesn't have. Um, and so it's definitely feasible in my mind that given the evidence in where no man has gone before, and the evidence, or lack thereof, in Balance of Terror, that there is no warp sled, there is no warp tow vehicle around, hanging around, that the Romulans have achieved a low level of faster than light drive using impulse engines, then it is feasible that the impulse drive can be used for faster than light travel. If you like this content and you want to see more, please like, subscribe, share, do all the buttony things that um, YouTube wants you to do, and comment, especially comment. I, I love to see your comments. Um, I'm a very small channel right now. I hope to grow bigger, uh, a lot bigger, and your comments will help me um, 
achieve those results. So special thanks to Salty Trekker and Salty Trekker, if you see this video, which I know you will, please link the description of your um, Balance of Terror analysis because that's a great video. I want everybody to see it. And I can't find it, unfortunately. So put that link in the comments and I will move it into the descriptions when I see that. And thank you again also to TrekCore because the still images are from TrekCore. And everyone, have a great day.